Okay guys, so last week in class we had talked about pages 77 through 100 and with most of my classes I got through most of the questions. Basically what we were talking about was this whole idea of, you know, they didn't have a lot of clues, they were very desperate to find out what was happening in the situation, you know, they had gone off on all these different um, tangents like these grudges that they thought that people had or these reasons, you know, the poisoned cat, whatever else. And the investigators really don't have a strong idea at this point of what is, you know, what caused the murder, why people committed this murder. And, um, you know, there were a lot of questions in your quiz about the theories for the murder and how many murderers they thought they were. But basically it all boils down to the fact that the only clue they have is the shoe print they don't know how many killers there were because of the depravity of the crime, which is to say how violent it was and the thought that went into it. Um, they can't imagine that two people would be that violent and that hateful towards the clutters. So at this point, um, in most of our discussions, we had gotten right up into talking about Perry's dream. And so I want to discuss his dream a little bit because we didn't get to talk about it as much as I would have liked to in class. Um, so basically just to go over the dream and what it kind of covers, um, Perry has this dream where he finds this tree in the middle of nowhere that has diamonds and jewels and all these amazing things that Perry could never have hanging off of it. And he goes after it. He tries to pull the diamonds off the tree. And he knows in the dream he has this idea that if he goes after... Sorry for the screen moving. If he goes after the diamonds, there's like a quicksand and it's going to get him. And he knows that it's dangerous for him to go after the diamonds, but he can't help himself. He wants to anyway. And so he gets to the tree and he starts pulling off the diamonds from the tree and the snake attacks him and it's trying to swallow him whole. It's trying to eat him. And out of nowhere, you know, in the moment of his doom, in the moment of his demise, this parrot, this big, yellow, gigantic, beautiful parrot swoops in and, and eats the snake and saves him. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I think that the reason that Capote told us about this, you know, you got to remember his flair for the dramatic, for storytelling, for poetry. I think there's a lot of symbolism in this dream that Perry shares. And just to kind of boil it down, because I don't want you to have to be watching this video forever, what I really think is that Perry's dream symbolizes that he knows that the way he goes about trying to get the things he wants in life, money, friendship, a lot of the things that he goes after, he knows that he's not going about it right, that it's a dangerous path, that he will not achieve happiness or health or financial stability through the ways that he goes about things. And yet he feels propelled to do those things. He can't help but do those things. And he longs to be saved. He longs to feel like, you know, before he gets arrested, before he feels compelled to kill, before he falls in with people like Dick, he wants someone to save him. And I think what we're seeing significantly more and more is that he doesn't make decisions to spend time with people who are going to save him. You know, he doesn't, his dad is not the kind of person who would save him. His dad's the one who puts him into the orphanage where the nuns beat him. And Dick's not the kind of person that's going to save him. Dick wants to take advantage of Perry and use Perry. And so we see that Perry doesn't have a yellow parrot. He doesn't have anyone to save him. But the idea of that is very attractive to him. And I think that that's why Capote puts that dream in there because he knows that, you know, symbolically, there's some definitely very interesting things with that dream. Um, so kind of looking at my notes here, um, the last thing that we haven't talked about from pages 77 through 100 is the um, con job that Perry and Dick pull when they're trying to get money to get out of town. So I feel like a lot of you don't know a lot about checks because we don't really use them very much anymore and you guys are more creatures of cash. But basically what they're doing is they're going around to different stores and they go to a suit shop and a jeweler and a couple of other places and they... Um, write checks expecting cash back um, and also write checks for things that they know there's no money in the accounts to pay for that. And that's a crime now. It was a crime then to pass bad checks. Um, you'll see things at, at stores like, you know, if your check isn't valid at the time that we deposit it, 
you know, that you can be fined, that you can be prosecuted, and it's something that normal people would avoid. But Dick and Perry are trying to, you know, capitalize on that. And so they end up with a lot of merchandise that they can pawn. And a pawning, I think you probably know what it is, but pawning is where you um, take something into a pawn shop, they appraise it and tell you how much it's worth, and they give you a fraction of what it's worth um, to basically hold it for you. And the idea is that eventually you'll get enough money to come back and get the thing back, uh, but most people don't. And then the pawn shop sells that stuff to other people. And it's a good way for Dick and Perry to get rid of the things that they've stolen because um, otherwise, you know, they couldn't just sell that stuff. People would find out and it would take too long and it's a lot easier, more direct route for them to get rid of their stolen goods. Um, so they get lots of money, they get a car, they get tons of goods. And this is the point where they start to head down to Mexico, but that's covered in chapter or pages 100 through 123. So we're going to talk about that in the next video.